The most innovative companies are going further with T-Mobile for business. Tractor Supply trusts 5G solutions from T-Mobile. Together, we're connecting over 2,200 stores with 5G business internet, empowering AI so team members can match shoppers with the products they need faster. This is enriching customer experience. This is Tractor Supply with T-Mobile for Business. Take your business further at T-Mobile.com slash now. Earning your degree online doesn't mean you have to go about it alone. At Capella University, we're here to support you when you're ready. From enrollment counselors who get to know you and your goals, to academic coaches who can help you form a plan to stay on track. We care about your success and are dedicated to helping you pursue your goals. Going back to school is a big step, but having support at every step of your academic journey can make a big difference. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Welcome to the Media Roundtable Special Edition in service of marketers responsible for the success of their audio program, or as we like to call them, the Chief Audio Officer. I'm your host, Dan Granger, founder and CEO of Oxford Road, and we're going to do a little history today. Here's a little uh, history lesson uh, on me. I have always been a bit of a, a nerd uh, in terms of just loving history, going to museums and watching every biopic I can get my hands on. And I watch documentaries for fun. Um, and when I when I got out of college, I worked for a company called Greystone Television that made History Channel documentaries because I thought that would be a cool way to blend my passion with a profession. But what I found out was as a PA and as a researcher, I was actually spending very little time learning about history and a lot of time in LA traffic running tapes around. And the day I realized I needed to switch industries was when I, I was supposed to get out of my car and go to a, a shoot for a documentary we were doing on uh, terror tech at the time. Um, and I didn't want to get out of the car because I was really captivated by what I was listening to on the radio and the the spoken word as a platform. And it was then that I realized that I wanted to go into this new field, this new canvas that is all conversation and the spoken word. And, you know, one of the, the challenges um, whenever you start a business is, you know, you do something because you're into it or you're good at it. And then you find out running a business often has little to do with the passion that got you there. Um, but I am so passionate about the content we are talking about today. And if, and if you had to say to me, like, hey, you're stuck on a desert island and you only get to listen to one publisher and their content for the rest of your life, who would it be? It would probably be that which is produced by our guest today. And that is the one and only Lindsey Graham. Uh, not that Lindsey Graham, we always have to say, uh, but he is the CEO and founder of Air ship a podcast publishing company he is webby award winning and ambi nominated he hosts podcasts that you might have heard of like american scandal american history tellers american elections wicked games business movers and he's got some new stuff happening that he's going to tell us all about it is his second time on this show last history lesson we had him on in 2021, when he was only reaching tens of millions of listeners with his content, now it's hundreds of millions of listeners. So, Lindsay, welcome back to the Media Roundtable podcast. Thank you so much. Yeah, sadly, it's I guess it's I'm not the one and only Lindsey Graham that has caused confusion in the past. You're the only one that matters to me, and uh, and apparently hundreds of millions. Uh, feel that way. So we're glad to have you back here. Congrats on all the success that you've had. You were already successful, but it seems like just things keep snowballing for you. And, you know, you have the rare um, position of not just being, you're, you're not just a pretty face, you are talent, but you also uh, produce uh, and create so much of the content uh, that you're involved with. And so there's a lot of great stuff for us to catch up on. If you were to just summarize in the last 36 months what's been going on with you and with airship do you mind just bringing us up to speed a little bit yeah sure so uh this that's pretty much uh the post-pandemic era right so uh we 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 survived um and um uh, I, I 
built more shows. That's what I, I, I do. So uh, I believe Business Movers kind of came out. That's a wondery uh, history of business show um, that replaced uh, a show that had run its course, my American Elections Wicked Game. Um, and then after that, I built another show, audaciously, uh, co-production with Noiser from in the UK called History Daily. So that's uh, that's six episodes a week, and that's been running for God, three years now. And uh, and I, I apparently didn't have enough of that, so um, I have put out two completely independent shows, um, a, a little kind of uh, fun history comedy quiz show called QEZ, but probably more interestingly is American Criminal, the first show that's uh, not only, you know, a full always on narrated history show, um, but in the true crime space, and it's not narrated by me. Uh, so kind of a, a big... How does that feel? Oh, uh, great. <laughs> um, well, you know, I can, I really only have so much room in my larynx uh, during the day. And if, if my company was to grow at all, I knew that it would have to be literally uh, including other voices. Now, so this is the first step in that direction. Lindsay, you, um, you've heard a little something about this whole uh, AI uh, topic, small thing in, uh, in the world today. Um, it's interesting you bring up the, the capacity of your larynx. Uh, how do you think about where the industry is headed and the fact that very easily you could be voicing shows without ever opening your mouth? There, most days I do, I do my best not to think about it at all um, because mm -hmm. it can be very frightening very quickly. Um, yeah. Right now, I think the technology is fantastic. I've, I've cloned my voice and listened back, and it is definitely sounds like me uh, having a bad day. <laughs> um, you know, like the performance isn't there, um, but it will be. And uh, yeah, give it know, a couple weeks, right? Right, exactly. Um, but one thing that 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 I do, uh, and probably most actual humans uh, do in their work, is interpret the the material. It, you know, it's not a verbatim script. There's, you know, I'm the final editor. I'm a, a, a you know, I put a spin on it. Um, I rewrite and reorganize and and do so much work that could not be done uh, with an AI cloned voice. So I mean, there would be a, a large portion of it missed, and I can't think of. You know, I, I, we would be saving my larynx, but 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 not. I, I'd have to hire another person to do all the the editing, and that would probably be me anyway. So, I don't know if it saves me any time. So it's not so much of an ethical thing at this point as much as it is just you haven't seen the value be as commensurate as advertised. Well, I mean, I, I think there's an ethical problem. Uh, my use of a AI cloned voice of me. That's pretty ethical. Someone yeah. else's use of an AI cloned me is 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 a different question altogether, and that's frightening. I mean, there's plenty of there's hours and hours of my voice uh, naked on the internet right now that you can train a model with. Someone yeah. could do it without my permission. That's that's super frightening. Um, but if I think about it in the in the the real workflow, uh, no, I I don't see. I don't see yet that it's it'll help um, enormously. I mean, maybe some pickups, maybe you know, if I'm on vacation, it could come to the yeah. rescue. And but I wouldn't want it to, to do the whole thing because you know the performance isn't there. The the critical thought behind behind the read isn't there. I have not heard somebody articulate the negatives of AI, particularly as it relates to our industry, in that way before. Uh, so I'm glad you're sharing that perspective because I think the assumption is, well, it can obviously or will soon be able to do everything we can do, so why not? But maybe that's not true because you can't have that meditative, organic reaction to the last thing that was said or you know, not everything you write communicates the same meaning when it's read. Uh, and so I think you're highlighting a, a limitation that kind of flies under the radar but it's actually quite practical. That's very helpful. Do you, um, I mean, we didn't plan to make this an AI discussion, but I do um, value your your perspective on it. Do you see it as a, a meaningful threat to our industry? I think it's meaningful to the industry. I think Sep it's Separate from the it's... existential threats that it may represent. Well, you know, um, it, it is the same threat that it is to every other media. 
you know, uh, print, video, graphic design, you know, all of it faces the same sort of generative problem, AI problem. But until it, it, it gets much, much better, you know, there will always be the, the you know, I'm, I'm more than, than my voice, right? I'm not the last reader. I'm the last editor. I'm the first listener. Right. You know, I'm, I'm hmm. the first person to ever hear these words spoken out loud by me and I modulate them and edit them and correct them. That still needs to be there. I saw, I, you know, I um, saw a wonderful distillation of the problem of AI. Why would I be, why would I bother to read something that you didn't bother writing? Hmm. Why would I bother consuming content that you didn't bother creating? Uh, which is, you know, kind of the point. Why are a, why is AI being leveraged for efficiency gains, right? Um, and very rarely for uh, to make a better a better piece of content. So um, wonderful perspective. If, if you zoom out and you look at it more broadly than just an industry event or or potential challenge, have we? Do you think? historically we've ever seen anything uh so monumental in its potential impact on our daily lives oh sure um yeah absolutely i i think you know i'm gonna I'm assume that we're approximately this you know the same age and i was thinking the other day that my father uh who was born in 1941 has you know seen uh grew up with radio saw television moved into personal com computers, got the internet, then cell phones and smartphones, and now uh, AI, all within his lifetime. And that's even before we get to uh, radio, the industrial revolution, the printing press, and keep going backwards. Um, these things completely change uh, our life, our everyday life. And now, increasingly, generation to generation, even half generation to half generation, uh, I think AI, probably is one of the larger ones uh, and, and might eclipse the internet. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, it just feels like the rate of change is what keeps accelerating. And I, you know, I've always tried to understand the times that we live in looking back a hundred years or, you know, just thinking about the fact that you could have been born at a certain point in the 19th century when they didn't have so much as a photograph or, you know, a telegram and then by the time you uh, you finish your life, you can step onto an airplane, you can watch a television. I mean, there's no way to really understand what it would be like before and after electricity, right? But it seemed like there was something analogous there. I just I just wonder about if we can even conceive of the 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 pace of the change that of everything that's now happening. But anyway, we could. We could probably do the full episode just theorizing about that to kind of bring it back into industry terms. Um, why is this stuff so important? Why is history, which I know not everything is history, um, but most of it's history related that you work on. Why is that important? Why is it a value to a listener? Well, I think we just explored why. You know, uh, if, if you, we are confronted with this momentous change. We're, we're scared of it. We're hopeful for it. Um, and we ask, uh, have, have we ever faced anything like this before? And the answer is yes and no. But the, the yes part of that, uh, of that answer is completely informed by history. And you know, the, the realization is that we are just as human now as we were 100, 1,000, 10,000 years ago. And so, um, you know, we as, as, as you know, this wet bag of machinery, of organic machinery, hasn't really changed. Our, the world around us sure has. So we react in very similar ways to, to we did to TV, radio, you know, the printing press. Um, this is why history is, is important, because history is human. We look at how things change. We learn um, from a, a macro and micro uh, perspective how lives and economies and countries and, and governments and uh, ideas have been shaped by the change we, we undergo. So yeah, I mean, when we think of AI, it is a forward and a backward looking question. Uh, 
what's going to happen, we don't know. Have we ever not known before? Well, every day of our history, you know, we've not known. So there's the lesson. And when you think about just the industry that we work in, in the last few years, what are the big, what, you know, someday we might think of a historic as historic just in our little world, what are some of the big changes you see happening besides AI in our field? Well, you know, um, I think it, it is mostly probably technologically driven. Certainly the, you know, the, 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 the dawn of podcasting, the, the serial moments, right? You coincided with smartphones and Bluetooth in cars, right? I think we can point to that technology as, as a breaking point for for podcasting i mean nothing i mean I'm, I'm, we'll we'll get letters for this but nothing really happened between 2005 and 2015 in terms of the broader industry right um then we had dynamic insertion right and programmatic uh, marketplaces which changed the character and the monetization of of, of the industry we also had you know our little industry blip uh, where we had the probably the professionalization and the overabundance or exuberance of an investment in the space uh, you know, that, that's probably par for the course for any growing industry. Uh, we might be seeing it in AI right now, for instance, but um, yeah, I, we've grown a lot as an industry since just 2015, certainly since 2020. Uh, and, and most of it has to do with um, figuring out the, the real, the real industry, you know, like, what are the roles and responsibilities? Who's doing this well? How do you do it well? What is monetization? Is this is this the limit to monetization? Um, you know, media is increasingly a, a fragmented and dangerous place to play in, but an essential one and one that most people consume every day. Okay, pop quiz: Have you ever heard of these companies? Shopify, Bayer, Oracle. Indeed, Masterclass, Babel, Tommy John, we could go on. You know, I don't just host the Media Roundtable podcast, but I have the good fortune of being the CEO of a company called Oxford Road, where we are the world's leading independently owned and operated agency specializing in audio. Think podcasts, radio, and streaming. And what that means is that we get to help great companies, companies worth fighting for, grow with audio advertising, whether it's podcasts, radio, or streaming, and all its various tentacles. This includes media planning and buying. We do analytics, attribution, and insights. We also have a special way that we deal with creative and copy generation. It's our own proprietary process called Audiolytics that allows us to score ads for their persuasiveness. Bottom line is we don't just work here. Audio is our passion, and we want to lead this industry to new heights uh, beyond what we've ever seen so far. That's why we've been leading the industry in brand safety and suitability and actually bringing you solutions to market so that you can evaluate the way uh, that you get placed in a show so that it matches up with your values in addition to avoiding the things that you know might be prob problematic for your brand. If you're a chief audio officer and you're looking to get best in market performance at maximum viable scale, do get in touch with us at OxfordRoad.com. Or if you love audio and are strategic, relentless, and looking for a career change, consider joining our mission as a fellow agent of influence. Just flip us your resume through OxfordRoad.com. And if you're working anywhere in the audio industry and you're serious about this business, make sure you go to OxfordRoad.com. Easy to spell. Sign up for our free newsletter, The Influencer, at OxfordRoad.com. And make sure you mention that you heard about us on the Media Roundtable podcast. Well, and you mentioned a few things that we talk about quite a bit. And I think uh, DAI, programmatic, and the professionalization of the industry, three big, significant shifts that are happening in front of us. We know what all the good things are. Uh, hopefully things are a little more efficient, right? Hopefully it's a little easier to consume. There's more choices, whether you're a listener or an advertiser. Uh, but what are some of the downsides of all of this change and all of this modernization of the craft? Well, you know, it's strangely, I think it 
uh, it goes back to my my lament at the beginning of the show. I I cannot scale my own voice, right? And you know, uh, while programmatic uh, uh, marketplaces and and DAI insertion of ads means that we have more access to more advertisers at a greater velocity. It does also mean that um, what we all acknowledge is the real power of podcasts, the intimacy with the host is diluted. Um, you know, these days, it, it was just four years ago that every single ad on my shows was read by me. Now it's probably 25%, right? Um, and uh, uh, maybe more, but around there. Um, that's that's a that's a qualitative difference, I think, in the feel of the show, and uh, and and so we have to we have to measure it like we do everything. Uh, the 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 increase in efficiency has brought with it a decrease in intimacy, uh, and is is the, is that worth the you know the balance? I think that from a monetary standpoint, it's not, and the marketplace doesn't know it yet. And you know, it maybe it's on incumbent of me and those who feel this way uh, to to demonstrate that, you know, with a with a financial projection or something. But I actually think that the 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 efficiency gains that we're realizing as we depersonalize it, as it's less about one person calling another, working directly with a host to build a relationship, get them to trust a product so they can effectively advocate authentically for that product. That's a lost art. And the rush to the greater commercialization is just more ad units uh, being served more efficiently and less personal relationship, which means less trust. And I think the value of an impression, you could have the same number of, an impression, of impressions on a show but the value of the impression that Lindsey Graham talks authentically about something that he uses personally and has conviction in versus anything that I'm going to be able to say about my own product and then shove it into your show as the third break in a set. They may get the same number of impressions, but there are multiples in difference of the impact of that impression. And so I think if you you know, set aside the nostalgia of it all and just the, you know, don't you wish we could go back to the old days where it was all, you know, everything was personal and, uh, you know, a little bit uh, more organic. Um, I do believe there's a commercial miss because I think the marketplace is over course corrected. And instead of like carving out lanes and having limits on each of those lanes, uh, we knew it was going to have to resemble radio to some extent uh, with a hybrid of produced ads and live ads. But I think that all of the infrastructure is kind of going towards um, the less personal version of that. And I think our best outcome is a both and world. I uh, would love for you to react to that. Well, I, I agree. I mean, like, I've, I'm the beneficiary of these eff efficiency gains. I spend less time writing and reading ads these days, you know, but my, mm -hmm. my overall incoming revenue is, you know, doing okay. I'm not taking a hit because I'm reading less ads. Um, but um, at the same time, you know, and, and it's not just, you know, the, the mythical personal connection with the brand, the authenticity, uh, which I agree with. But um, also there is just a familiarity. There's a tonal you know, uh, consonants that a host read ad has um, because it's so different from a music bedded sound effect, it very smiley uh, voiceover artist, um, commercial radio style ad. They, they, it's like expecting to, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a metaphor, but I'm, um, you know, expecting to, to hop in a, in a car and find yourself on a horse. You know, they both go in different directions and, and have different things, but the, the experience of, of riding one is so different. So, yeah, I, 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 I might agree with you that um, there is uh, an overcorrection to, to the efficiency of the marketplace, you know, to the scale. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the friction of, uh, if, we, if we abandoned the ease of selling, if we got rid of all the efficiencies that did accrue uh, through marketplace selling, then you know we would have to pay for a lot of friction, a lot of people managing individuals, a lot of more selling, you know, 
person to person. And that probably only means the larger podcasts get these deals because they, they, they have themselves this, the, the scale, the audience to justify those things. So I, I worry that um, there's a, you know, one of the, the great things about podcasting is it, it's DIY spirit and it's, you know, it's egalitarian nature that without uh, a sufficient and healthy marketplace uh, monetization solution that, that a lot of the smaller uh, shows would, would lose out. I think that's a great perspective. And it, one of the other areas that I, I see tech impacting us in really big ways is around this, this idea of brand safety, which was really the driving force behind this, this specific podcast the media roundtable was to try to address what became the brand safety industry. We just didn't talk about it with that label originally. Um, how much do you bump up against that? And how, how much do you know about what's going on there? Well, the, frankly, not, not much um, because, you know, from where I'm sitting, I don't get to see the pitches that don't get sold. Right. Uh, right. It's, 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 I'm, I'm pretty upstream or, or downstream of the, uh, the sales cycle here. Um, I do find that there are some advertisers that that are not a fit for a variety of reasons. Like, one, I don't take supplements, for instance, right? I just don't mm -hmm. believe in the industry. I don't like to ingest things that I'm, I'm not really 100% uh, aware of. So I, I choose not to to uh, uh, participate in, in personal experience for supplement companies. There are other things that, that get too close to the bone in terms of uh, political conversations. Um, you know, the Ukraine war, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, those can get pretty hot. And so you may opt out of them. In terms of my shows, um, you know, I know that um, history can sometimes be contentious. Uh, you just have to look at the, you know, the New York Times, uh, or what was it? Um, Oh, I've forgotten the, the year, uh, their, their project on, on slavery and uh, in 1619. Yeah, thank you. And to know that, that there's a, a large amount of contention in even 100-year-old uh, history, and there's certainly uh, contention in modern history. And uh, it, it, we live in fractious times. But I don't think that's, that's a matter of brand safety. Um, if, if that's the case, then CNN or MSNBC would have no commercials whatsoever. I, in fact, I, I would probably submit that history is a very safe place for, for most brands because it's a contemplative examination of facts um, and, uh, and not too well, well, well when, done, when done well. Um, so, yeah, I'll toss it back to you. What have you heard? Well, one safety? would think, one would think. Um, yeah, so, so it's interesting because we had a lot of advertisers that, we're finding themselves getting a lot of pressure from internal and external stakeholders to do and don't affiliate with certain ideologies um, or political opinions. And that was, it was understandable why there was a problem. And, you know, one of the things we were deeply involved with, we've helped bring three or four, depending on how you want to count it, different solutions to market to deal with this problem. The challenge that we have seen is that no matter what you do, there's a lot of keyword detection and there's not a lot of human oversight when people are making purchasing decisions. And so what'll happen is you'll get um, flagged because of the topics that you discuss. And, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. If you're talking Israel and Palestine, you know, there may be brands that don't want to get near that. And that's understandable. Um, the part that you know, has been our big conclusion is that it gets, it, it's so um, error ridden, it's so error prone to what gets flagged because of the keywords. And the, they're not as good contextually, none of the tech is as good contextually as we'd like to believe. So what will happen is like, I just, I just pulled up one of yours uh, real quick. So if you go to American history tellers, um, you are a medium risk for firearms uh, low risk, but there is risk for harmful acts, uh, low risk for death, injury, military. Um, there are others. Dan Carlin ha has gotten hit pretty hard uh, by the, the terms that are being measured by the systems um, because of the, the things he describes in his show. Now, if you're doing crime, that's going to be a problem. 
Um, if you're talking about politics, even if you're talking about it from 200 years ago, uh, you know, something that the Whigs uh, were saying may actually result in a brand not placing an ad dynamically on your show because they set a low risk tolerance on a certain topic that right. was then interpreted through keywords in transcripts and nobody ever looked at the thing. So they just never even saw uh, the placement. And so, you know, we've been making a lot of noise about this because there are a lot of good shows that get unfairly rated and it's guilt by association with nouns, with the wrong nouns. What our solution to that was we worked with a company called Seeker <clears throat> to make something called the civility score. And the civility score measures how much personal attack is going on per hour in a piece of content, because that's the thing that we find is what gets brands into trouble is when the, the, the host of the show is actually attacking an individual or a group of individuals. And there's probably going to be a backlash to that. Eventually they'll get hit for something and the advertiser gets caught in the crossfire. American history tellers is a 97 civility score. Uh, and if we could get people to use that as a primary metric, you know, to the, to the extent we can, we, we're going to keep advocating for this. Um, we believe that advertisers will make sensible decisions that actually help them stay away from truly uh, problematic conf content that could have a backlash versus that which is just uh, the inefficiencies of, you know, a system like it's our over reliance on technology that's not fully there. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, again, a shadow of our AI conversation. Um, I, it sounds like a technological problem, and and the solution has to be that um, th this this proliferation of, of false positives has to somehow be be painful for the advertisers um, before they will want to make a change um, and and move to a different metric. I think probably it's far too easy to um, to just be safe as possible. Uh, and and fulfill your your your, your insertion order elsewhere. Um, so I, I would wonder, you know, how how is it painful? What is the missed opportunity that you that the industry can say to these advertisers? Like, yeah, well, totally understandable that you didn't uh, advertise on these three uh, history podcasts because the word musket came up and they get flat flat as <laughs> firearms. But here's what you missed out on. Uh, this audience, this buying behavior, these these you know fans of your your brand or potential fans, um, I don't know how that gets communicated up the chain so that there is this you know this overwhelming FOMO that gets the, uh, advertisers to listen more to a different metric. Yeah, we're working on that. And like for example, I like to talk about Meet the Press because the podcasts are Meet the Press. If you're a brand, you're going to set low tolerance levels for brand safety. But it's meet the press will come up as medium for death, injury, military, medium for harmful acts, medium for sensitive social issues, medium for terrorism. You won't you can't go on the longest running show in the history of television since 1947. The civility scores a 94. So we believe that technology can actually help solve a lot of this. Uh, but but I actually think there's a human problem that is greater than the technical problem, which is that we don't even know what questions to ask. And the questions that we've kind of agreed on are these GARM framework uh, categories that force you into measuring things that aren't actually helpful, even though they start with the right intentions. Um, and, you know, like your history daily has a 99 uh, civility score, but medium harmful acts. Um, yep. And, well, because uh, throughout history, people have killed themselves and others. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, so, you know, I think part of the, the macro message here may be that um, there's a lot of great things happening in this, this stage of our history as an industry and just as a, as a people. Um, but there's a lot of uh, easy to miss problems that are uh, costing people a lot of um, money uh, commercially, but the bigger problem, I think, the societal problem is, if if you end up defunding support from advertisers for the most important conversation topics in the world, then how do you have an informed populace? And if you can't afford to pay a subscription for something, 
um, ad supported is the only way you're going to get your information. And so I do think there's a kind of a greater issue at stake here. And we know the news business has been challenged. And I, I suspect history uh, is not exactly um, getting the market share that it should relative to its value uh, as a result of some of these issues as well. Um, yeah, it's a good point. You know, um, I don't, I don't know that, that, uh, well, it's, it's, it's akin to the, the, the kind of disadvantage, the handicap that, um, that a lack of programmatic advertising would place on smaller shows. Yeah, I, uh, I have no solutions for you, Dan. I'm no, you, and you don't have it. to. All you've got to do is just uh, be aware of the, of the issue and keep doing what you're doing. Um, I know we only have a little bit of time left. I do want to hear about the, the newer shows uh, that you've been producing. So, um, And by the way, uh, QEZ, uh, that, was a new, that was a whole new format for you. That was a very different uh, vibe. What did you learn uh, from that production? Uh, that it's a lot harder than I imagined. Uh, Is it really? I mean, writing, Why? The the writing and research. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a completely different show. Uh, the the setup is this: it's a it's a history trivia uh, show, and my panelists contestants are three comedians, and I will ask them questions, and they will either have to uh, give me the right answer, or give me an answer that is so fake and compelling that it, it fools the other contestants into thinking that that it's correct. So it's kind of like the, 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 the game Balderdash. And it turns out that writing uh, short, pithy, clever questions that, that elicit good responses is an art. And, um, and we're still figuring out how to do it well. Um, do you use AI for that ever? I did today. I tell you what, because I wrote an, a, a question that I liked, but it was too long. Um, so I needed to cut it down almost by, you know, by a third. And so I asked um, Claude, um, Alphonics Claude, uh, not Alphonic, uh, uh, Anthropics Claude, to give me three suggestions of shorter, um, shorter versions of the question. It did an okay job, but what it did is prompt me into a better place where I've, I managed it on my own. I took you know, the melange of ideas. But yeah, it's, it's super fun for me. You know, it, it, I'm no longer scripted. I have to react in real time to real personalities and try and keep the, you know, uh, the ball going you know, up in the air at all times. I'm just, it's a, it's a game of segues for me. <clears throat> and um, so it's been a lot of fun, uh, completely different from everything else we do. And then American Criminal, as I mentioned before, is very similar to what we do in format. It's a, you know, 45 minute narrated a narrative history show um, about criminals in American history um, and uh, narrated by a friend of mine um, who was um, a great voice actor uh, and, and appeared in our audio drama, 1865. So that's going really well. I, I don't mean to ask this as a political jab, truly, but when you think about um, the news last week uh, with Trump uh, getting a guilty verdict, um, do you feel like you have a responsibility to include that in your content? And if so, which one do you put them on? Do you put them on American Criminal? Uh, you... Well, um, I, I guess, I mean, that, that could uh, fit the bill. You've got a few um, different but, shows uh, that could work for that one. The good news about my shows is uh, they are history shows. They're not current event shows. So we have to wait a few years before, you know, really we've, we've got the body of, of uh, literature behind it. The, the, the Trump convictions will absolutely go in a refreshed episode of American Elections Wicked Game. Mm -hmm. We've been re-releasing that over the past 56 weeks or whatever ahead of the, uh, uh, the election day, November 5th. And uh, so this will be part and parcel of the, the, the newest uh, episode uh, that <laughs> we obviously haven't written yet. Well, and as you think about this election cycle, they always say to us, uh, this is uh, future democracy and the most important election in, in history. What do you think? Is it as important as stated? I think there's a lot of fatigue uh, and people are kind of like rolling their eyes a little bit at this point. And we're all just kind of holding our breath and waiting for a new era uh, wherever you sit. Uh, but what yeah. do you think? How, 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 what are we in for in the next six months? Well, I don't know if I can answer that, but I mean, the entire point of, of that podcast I mentioned, American Elections Wicked Game, 
was to go back to the very first presidential election and, and every one since and investigate whether there was a good old days of politics, you know, that, that we, you know, we wring our hands and moan today, oh, it's so bad. Well, was it ever good? And the answer is no. I mean, sometimes it was neutral, but it was never good. I mean, we did horrible things to each other all the time, every single election, probably except for the first one, which was unanimous, you know, behind George Washington, uh, had some horrible backstabbing and skullduggery going on. Um, some were more consequential than others. Um, certainly one or two of them provoked, uh, you know, real and serious political cons you know, considerations like a civil war. <clears throat> I don't think we're there now. But yeah, I would say that the, that the, the recent political movement uh, climate is different. It has a tenor. Um, I think when we, when we think back to probably the history of the Republican Party, we will, we will call this the age of Trump, just like we, we call the, the start of the Democratic Party the age of Jackson. Uh, it is a foundational or um, certainly a significant change in the policy apparatus and, and complexion of the Republican Party uh, that we'll have to reckon with in the history books. Agreed. Um, final question uh, before we let you go, Lindsay. Um, if if uh, somebody were to uh, hear this for the first time and decide where they were going to start listening to all of the shows uh, that you've created, is it American Criminal? Is there some? Is there a favorite that you have? Where would you ask recommend somebody start? And then part two, what's the first show that they should try to sponsor? Well. <clears throat> Having it been newly launched, uh, obviously you need to listen and sponsor American Criminal. That's that's the one we need to grow the most. But, um, you know, that's a really difficult question, mainly because I know audience reaction is so similar. Very, the, one of the most common comments I get um, is, I never thought this would be interesting, but it was. I was surprised by how much I was invested in this topic. I really enjoyed learning something I, I knew nothing about. So it's almost a guarantee that if you pick one of them, just with a dart, you might land on something uh, that you're like, I thought I knew this, or I have no interest in this whatsoever. Start listening, and you will soon realize that there's layers and layers and, and amazing stories, captivating people, horrible and amazing events all the time. And from there, just skip around. I, I don't know if I could I could really point something out. You can't tell us which you which of your babies is your favorite. I get it. I get it. Lindsay, uh, I I love when we get a chance to talk, whether it's in the hallway at a conference uh, or on this show. Um, but I, I appreciate all that you do uh, for this industry. And I feel like, you know, as, as commercial and as kind of factory oriented as it's getting, I feel like you really uh, still care about the canvas and uh, using it to do interesting work that elevates the experience for the listener and consequently for the, for the sponsor. So, so thank you for taking this time with us and thanks for the work that you continue to do in this field. Well, thank you. And the same to you. I appreciate the work you do. Thank you. Thank you all for joining the media Roundtable. This podcast is brought to you by Oxford road, where we want you to succeed in audio and to use your influence for good as members of the marketing community, we have the power to advance voices that don't just entertain, but edify and to build bridges across our differences and preserve fair-minded discussion around the most important topics of our age. If you're a marketer looking to align your brand values with extraordinary business outcomes, reach out to our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. If you have any feedback for how we can make this show even better for you, reach out to us at info at mediaroundtable.com. Don't forget to listen to Ad Infinitum, our other podcast. It is only about audio creative, and they break down some of the top ads across podcast, radio, and streaming uh, every week with some really um, some of the industry leading voices around that subject matter. Special thanks to Lindsay for joining us, as well as Bianca, Kyle, Haley, Ezra. Mary Jane, and of course, the whole team of Podcast One. As always, influence responsibly.
the most innovative companies are going further with T-Mobile for business. Together with Delta, we're putting 5G into the hands of ground staff so they can better assist on-the-go travelers with real-time information. From the Delta Sky Club to the Jet Bridge, this is elevating customer experience. This is Delta with T-Mobile for Business. Take your business further at T-Mobile.com slash now. Earning your degree online doesn't mean you have to go about it alone. At Capella University, we're here to support you when you're ready. From enrollment counselors who get to know you and your goals, to academic coaches who can help you form a plan to stay on track. We care about your success and are dedicated to helping you pursue your goals. Going back to school is a big step, but having support at every step of your academic journey can make a big difference. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu.